on this Saturday night, stepping down after stunning allegations around foreign interference. Why an Ontario PC government caucus member has resigned while rejecting the claims against him. If he chooses evil ideology. Shielding performers from protests. With multiple happening every week. Why there's a sharp rise in hate against the queer community and from who? The gender gap in health data. You're going to end up with a biased algorithm. And how it's skewing artificial intelligence research. You and I have a different idea of Q. And the Canadian nominee. That's my favorite thing about working in animation. Hoping to strike Oscar gold once again. Global National with Farah Nasser. Reporting tonight, Neetu Garcha. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with developments surrounding a global news investigation into allegations of foreign interference in Canada's 2019 federal election. Ontario Premier Doug Ford says he's supporting Vincent Ka, who was a member of Ford's progressive conservative government until he opted out last night, choosing to sit as an independent. This follows bombshell allegations from intelligence sources that Ka was part of a covert network helping to advance Beijing's agenda in Canada. Vincent Ka says he is stepping away from the Progressive Conservative Caucus in order to dedicate his time to clearing his name and representing his constituents. A spokesperson for Doug Ford told Global News, while the allegations against Mr. Ka are not proven, they're serious and deserve his full and undivided attention as he works to clear his name. A third parliamentary committee has now opened its own investigation into foreign interference. David Aiken has our top story tonight. One of the best MPPs around. When he won his Toronto area riding in the Ontario provincial election of 2018, Vincent Ka became the first immigrant from mainland China to take a seat at Queen's Park. The member for Don Valley North. I'd like to take this opportunity. But sources in Canada's federal intelligence community have told Global News that Ku was also part of an alleged foreign interference network to advance the political agenda of the government in Beijing and that he was provided with $50,000 to do that work. Ku said such allegations are nonsense. False accusation. This is racist. I told him in the email already. You say it's racist? Why is it it's racist? It's racist because I was born in China, because I come from China. But many in Canada's Chinese communities support more aggressive action by Ottawa to confront the regime in Beijing. I believe that the government should take a stronger message and also take a stronger stance. Even while cautioning those pushing for bolder action not to fan the flames of anti-Chinese racism. The notion that all ethnic Chinese communities are supporter of the Chinese authorities is racist and reductive. Kwan and Wong testified Friday at the House of Commons Ethics Committee. It's the third parliamentary committee that is looking at foreign interference by China in Canada's affairs. Another committee is focused specifically on election interference. And the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians, which meets behind closed doors, is examining information collected by Canada's national security agencies. It is important that we explain to Canadians how it is that we are putting in place the measures that our agencies use to address and mitigate um, uh, against foreign interference. The work of parliamentarians will complement that of the special rapporteur Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has promised to appoint to look into all of this. No government has taken more concrete action than ours when it comes to fighting against foreign interference. One of the rapporteur's jobs will be to advise the government as to whether a full-blown public inquiry is required. And we will abide by their recommendation. But the Prime Minister has not yet said when that rapporteur will be appointed or who it will be. David Aiken, Global News, Ottawa. There is some turbulence over at Flair Airlines. Four of the company's planes are no longer operational after a U.S. leasing company seized them in a commercial dispute. A source tells Global News the low-cost Canadian airline was apparently days behind on payments worth $1 million to Lessor Airborne Capital. It was also given prior notice that Airborne wanted to terminate leases on the four planes. A statement by Flair says payment has been initiated and that it's engaged in mediation to remedy the situation. It's also activated three spare aircraft to make up for disruptions.
A day after one of the largest bank failures in American history forced Washington to intervene, there are growing concerns for a potential spillover effect when markets open on Monday. After more than 40 years of operation, Silicon Valley Bank, a leading lender for tech startups, ran short on cash due. As Reggie Cicchini explains, it's left customers unsure if they'll have access to their money. It took only a matter of hours for the 16th largest bank in the United States to go from stable ground to underwater. I am pretty concerned. Silicon Valley Bank was a go-to in the tech world. Decades of experience turned it into a leading lender for startups. Now its sudden and abrupt downfall has trapped billions in investments and deposits. A little nerve-wracking uh, when it comes down to <laughs> how you keep operating your company. The concern started midweek when, in need of assets, the bank sold off bonds, but at a loss. Its capital shrank and resulted in the beginnings of a bank run. By Friday, federal regulators swooped in to provide financial guardrails. That's what they were doing, was protecting the deposits of those up to 250000 and then they have a way to unwind the rest. That could throw a wrench into some companies' finances if they're unable to access money beyond the insured $250,000. When banks experience financial losses, it is and should be a matter of concern. Before the dust could settle, markets were rattled and sell-offs could bleed into Monday. Blame is being partially laid on high interest rates, with the Fed now walking a tightrope. So on the one hand, they're trying to tame inflation, um, and in the process, they might tip the economy into a recession. At the same time, we have this emerging financial uh, instability risk. This is the largest bank failure since the 2008 crisis. And while niche banks tied to one sector may feel stress, major institutions are likely to avoid catastrophic loss. The reforms that were put in a place back then uh, really provide the kind of resilience that we'd like to see. Silicon Valley Bank did have operations in Canada, and the big banks felt the squeeze, erasing nearly $20 billion in value on Friday. Many of them have acquired regional banks in the U.S., increasing exposure to this bank's failure. Neethu? Reggie Cicchini in Washington. Thanks, Reggie. There was another round of contention over family-friendly drag events in this country today. In New Brunswick, a large group of counter-protesters in support of drag performers and LGBTQ2S plus rights faced off with a much smaller rally opposing drag storytime events. It happened outside an event at the Moncton Library where organizers received dangerous threats online ahead of the event. These drag performances have become frequent targets of hatred and backlash. As Heather Urex West reports, it's happening as far-right attacks on the community seem to be on the rise. Why can't boys wear skirts and bracelets and nail polish, Jesse asked the boys. Launched in Calgary in 2018, Reading with Royalty has seen drag kings and queens read stories about inclusion to children. But in recent months, events like these have faced opposition and protest. It comes and goes in waves, but since I would say about November, we've just had it weekend after weekend and it's getting stronger. If you choose this evil ideology... It's not just Calgary. The U.S.-based Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project has been tracking anti-LGBTQ2 protests across North America. In the U.S., the increase has been striking, with the number of demonstrations nearly tripling in 2022. The group says the rise in Canada is slower, but numbers in this country are trending upwards as well. We're seeing protests against the LGBTQ plus community uh, occurring across Canada right now, uh, with multiple happening every week. So what exactly is going on? The Canadian Anti-Hate Network says there has been a pivot by far-right movements around the globe, from COVID conspiracy theories to a narrative involving the LGBTQ2 community. Sexualizing children is totally wrong. It's the most wrong thing of all. It's the same age-old conspiracy theory that queer people are, are pedophiles and are coming after your children. They're just rehashing it and, and use it against the trans community. Online spaces that once supported Canada's freedom convoy against COVID restrictions are now filled with transphobic memes. If you don't like drag queen story time, simply don't go. But to go up and protest and take away somebody else's safe space, their own sense of community, um, you know, is not only irresponsible, it's incredibly dangerous. We are now calling the police. Oh, 
Calgary police have charged a man with hate-related crimes after he shouted homophobic slurs at a library event. They're also investigating a gun threat made towards the queer community. Within that community, people feel under attack. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. On this day in 2020, the World Health Organization officially deemed the COVID-19 outbreak a pandemic. Three years later, it remains a global threat with public health emergencies in place across dozens of countries. There have been significant milestones in vaccines and therapies, but despite widespread immunity, the WHO still considers COVID a public health emergency of international concern. Doctors say part of the issue stems from a lack of understanding about how COVID started because data and intelligence gets tied up in politics. We have to admit that the billions of dollars we've invested in the last 20 years and the millions of people that we have trained in public health and built laboratories around the world did not prevent this pandemic. And we have 7 million people dead. So let's just admit that what we thought we had done failed us and let's fix it. There is unanimous support among U.S. lawmakers to release classified information to better understand this health crisis. Governments are also being urged to regulate research, keep data accessible, and spend more on public health to better prepare for another virus. Artificial intelligence can be a powerful tool in the healthcare sector, synthesizing large amounts of data to spot new trends, all the while helping doctors make informed and educated decisions. But when it comes to information about women and their own personal health, experts say there's a gap. Catherine Ward explains. If we don't do the research, we won't have those answers. Effective medical treatments rely on good information, and that's key to developing AI models, says expert Ashley Cassavin. If you're putting bad data into, uh, into the system, then you're going to get a bad outcome. A bad outcome would be an inaccurate answer to what the diagnosis should be. Dr. Thalia Field says women are not well represented in medical research. The proportions of people who have the disease in reality are not reflected by the proportions of people who are in the clinical trial. Data from the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada echoes this finding. According to a recent report, two-thirds of participants in clinical trials on heart disease and stroke have been men. When women are included, researchers don't always analyze the data by sex and gender. We need to account for both biological differences, which may be related to hormones and anatomy and body compositions. There are many reasons why women are not well represented. Sometimes women may not be able to take time from uh, caring for elderly parents or caring for children or uh, due to issues with their work to be able to get away to participate in study follow-ups. The paper further explains conditions that are more common or serious in women but rare in men typically get less attention. With artificial intelligence being used more widely in medicine, from trying to predict drug use outcomes or helping doctors decide if chemotherapy would be useful, having good data is critical because an algorithm can only learn from the information it's been given. So if there are biases in the data that go into training the algorithm, you're going to end up with a biased algorithm. Experts say addressing this data gap is critical, so advanced tools like AI are relevant and trustworthy, regardless of a patient's gender. Catherine Ward, Global News, Toronto. Rising floods and fears. Coming up, rounds of deadly storms as thousands evacuate in California. California is under a state of emergency tonight. Two people are dead and some 10,000 people have been forced to flee their homes as catastrophic flooding triggered by another fierce winter storm washes through the Golden State. Rivers are overflowing, communities cut off. This latest atmospheric river is dumping torrential rain and even more snow on a state that is still desperately trying to dig out from a series of powerful storms. And warming temperatures in the days ahead could exacerbate the flooding as the Sierra Nevada snowpack begins to melt. To Italy now, where the country's Coast Guard has rescued more than 1,300 migrants crossing the sea overnight. 
The migrants were brought ashore after three separate operations that began on Friday on multiple vessels overloaded with people off Italy's southern coast. One boat was found to have been carrying around 500 people alone. The rescues come weeks after the Italian Coast Guard faced criticism over the deaths of 74 migrants in a shipwreck around the same region. Ahead, the unlikely path for an Alberta music star set to take the Juno stage. The best and brightest talents in Canada will be at the Judos this Monday in Edmonton, many of whom you probably already know. But on the new reality this weekend, we met an up-and-coming artist you may not know but probably should. Mike Drolet has more on Ace and Abby, whose path to the Judo stage was anything but easy. Take me somewhere oh. Ace and Abby is not yet a household name. His voice and deeply personal songwriting is turning heads, thanks to his debut album and anthemic single, Nomads. But his journey to the Juno stage is even more powerful. I was gone all these years. He's OG Cree from the Sandy Lake First Nation in Northern Ontario. He grew up off the grid with only a guitar to keep him busy. He dreamt of a career in music, but to make ends meet, he took a job as a surveyor for a mining company. On a cold February day, he was snowshoeing by himself over a frozen river when the ice cracked. That was the moment his life changed forever. I had multiple family members that had, had froze to death, and I was just like, what am I doing with my life? Like, what? Is this where it ends, like, like doing this job I don't care about? Like, I didn't even get to try to do anything I wanted to do with my life. How long after that did you quit? I had a plane ticket and I was gone in three months. He moved to Toronto, where he eventually applied for the International Indigenous Music Summit. You gonna take me the music that finally got him noticed is intensely personal, inspired by his grandfather's memories of residential schools. When the summit's founders hit play on his video submission, they were floored. We both were just like, who is this? Whoa. How have we never seen this or heard this before? It just stopped us in our tracks. You know, it, it just had that quality of, it, it yeah. like, got me in my solar plexus, you know? Am I losing myself? Trying to find you. Now signed to the record label Ishkade, Ace and Abby's schedule has very few holes in it. He's booked for shows not only in Canada and the U.S., but throughout Europe. Is your life a whirlwind right now? Yeah, yeah. We're looking at the schedule and, like, it's insane. Like, it's, I think I'll, I might get some time in late September. <laughs> That's down the road. Right now, the focus is the Junos, where Ace and Abby will not only perform, but could potentially win his first award. Mike Drolight, Global News, Toronto. Mike will have more on his remarkable story on the new reality tonight at 7 p.m. here on Global. Next, meet the Canadian Oscar hopeful whose latest film is up for gold. The Academy Awards are tomorrow, and a few talented Canadian filmmakers are nominated for the prestigious Golden Statues. Among them, Ontario Rays director Chris Williams for his animated movie, The Sea Beast. It wouldn't be his first Oscar nod, though. As Far Nasser reports, he's already had a hand in animating many beloved classics. A swashbuckling adventure filled with sea monsters, cutthroat hunters, and a lot of heart. Can I take a photo? Oh, of course, of you guys? yeah. All from the mind of Canadian American filmmaker Chris Williams, director of the Oscar nominated animated movie The Sea Beast. Very nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you, okay. too. We caught up with Williams ahead of a special screening of the film back in his hometown of Kitchener, Ontario, where he first drew inspiration as a young storyteller. When I was very young, my dad bought me uh, a camera and I started making little stop motion films. And I just was des desperate to create stories and express myself. And, and when I started seeing movies like King Kong and Raiders of the Lost Ark and Star Wars, those big, broad adventure stories, um, they captivated me. Now a veteran at the animation industry, he spent 25 years at Walt Disney Animation Studios, where he helped create many of their beloved characters. Hey, let me say you're welcome, welcome. For the wonderful world you know. 
and he's no stranger to awards glory either. Williams directed the superhero adventure Big Hero 6, a hit at the box office in 2014, going on to nab his first Oscar for Best Animated Film. Big Hero 6 is a really good movie. I've watched it before. I've actually watched it twice and enjoyed both times. It's a really good movie. I'm still shocked that he actually made the movie. With his latest feature on Netflix, Williams has now set sail beyond Disney's Enchanted Castle on his own, putting a new spin on a well-known setting. You and I have a different idea of cute. <gasps> Though the Sea Beast revolves around a classic ocean adventure, it features a more diverse cast of characters and tackles tough themes all too familiar to adults, like the power of disinformation and the violence that can follow. This was a course on media literacy, <laughs> honestly. Some of these entrenched ideas, you need to look at them, uh, uh, examine them a little closer and, and not just accept at face value everything that you're told. And so yeah, that was something that we definitely explored with the film. As to how the story's crew of roughnecks face those issues, he believes the answer is distinctly Canadian. I think it's something that is more universal across Canada. A sense of community, a sense that people are going to look out for each other. That organism that is the crew, uh, they're very reliant on each other, right? They each, each of them have to do their job and do it well for their very survival. The whole industry has gotten bigger and bigger. In Making Sea Beast, Williams worked with many artists based in Canada, inspiring younger animators to join the ranks. I love creating and art in general. I like telling a story, so I thought animation would be a good way to go into that because that's the best way. It can make someone move, make someone have feelings, emotions. Oscar winning director. And as they follow his path into the rough waters of movie making, he's got one important piece of advice. No one person could explain to you how an animated how an animated movie gets made, right? We are so dependent on each other, and I actually really love that. That's my favorite thing about working in animation. Farah Nasser, Global News. And that is Global National for this Saturday night. I'm Neetu Garcha. Tonight's Air Canada is a vibrant view of Vancouver at night. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you again tomorrow. Have a great night.